My Lord Mayor, Sheriff's Chief, Commoner, Provost, I still think I was right. <laughs> Some judges can be very obtuse. <laughs> well, you've already heard a lot of facts that not many people know. I'm going to give you, I hope, another one. 20 years after he conquered England, William the Conqueror ordered a survey of the wealth of the nation. The Doomsday Book does not mention London. The Normans had introduced a strict feudal hierarchy whose wealth was measured in land. The measure used in the book was the hide, the amount of land sufficient to support one household. But the cities of England didn't fit easily into this pattern. London was not included in the survey because Norm the Normans didn't rely on the wealth from trade, only from land. London, however, as you've already heard, was to play a crucial role in the events leading up to the granting of the Charter in 1215. The rebel barons are not named in the Charter, but we have their identity from the chronicles of Matthew Paris, a monk, a Benedictine monk in the Abbey of St. Al Albans. They were men of Norman descent. The Charter also records, however, that the king made the grant on the advice of certain barons and senior clergy. These supporters of the king were also men of Norman descent, with one exception, the mayor of London. He, his name, as you've been told already, William Hardell, not a Norman name, one of his colleagues, Serlo the Mercer, again, not a Norman name. The first extant list of aldermen of London was published in 1127. Their names, too, were Anglo-Saxon. Trade, commerce, was a means for the Anglo-Saxons to reassert a role in the life of the nation. London's development uh, as an autonomous entity had lagged behind that of cities on the continent of Europe. John's father, Henry II, who ruled from 1154 to 1189, discouraged the growth of power in the cities for fear that they would resist the central government. By contrast, the cities of Lombardy in northern Italy had grown increasingly prosperous and powerful, being, as they were, at the crossroads of trade routes from the Mediterranean to northern Europe. They were fitted into the feudal system as vassals of the Emperor of Germany, later the Holy Roman Emperor. But they tried to claim the right to govern themselves. Frederick Barbarossa, who became emperor in the same year as Henry II became king, tried to reassert his power over the cities, and this, in turn, led to 16 of them forming the Lombard League. They swore an oath of association called a sacramentum to preserve the privileges of the city against Frederick. In 1176, the League decisively defeated him at the Battle of Legnano, and he consequently granted them the right to levy their own taxes, to administer their own civil and criminal courts, and to oversee the welfare of their cities. They came to appoint a council of consuls led by a podesta to administer the individual cities, some of you who've been to Florence will have seen the Podesta's house in the main square in Florence. Over the same period, the larger cities in France established a degree of autonomy, governing themselves by consuls and a leader they called by the Latin Maior, the greater. In England, meanwhile, royal officials were sheriffs, they presided in the county courts and they collected taxes and they became very unpopular. They were seen as money-grabbing, corrupt and oppressive in the way that they leveled taxes. Uh, 
Royal records for 1129 describe the citizens of London offering King Henry I 100 marks for the right to appoint their own sheriff. In 1130, the records show they were granted the right. And the following year, Henry I granted the city its first charter. We only have its wording from later documents which purport to rehearse its terms, but it appears to have given the citizens of London the right to choose whomsoever they will from among themselves to be sheriff in return for promising the crown a, a lump sum of 300 pounds a year in taxes. The sheriff was to conduct proceedings both in the local court, which was called a husting, but also trials in serious matters which were elsewhere conducted by royal judges. The citizens of London were granted a number of other special privileges, including hunting rights in the Chilterns. If any of you commute from there, you might like to reassert them. <laughs> what you would hunt there these days, I'm not sure. Uh, Richard the Lionheart, Richard I, became king in 1189, and not long after departed on his crusade to the Holy Land. He left his chancellor, William Longchamp, in charge of the kingdom. He soon became unpopular, and London seems to have grabbed the chance to assert an independent position. From 1191, leaders of the city are recorded, starting with the very first Henry Fitzalwin. In the autumn of that year, the opposition to Longchamp became so great that he fled the kingdom, and King Richard replaced him with Walter of Coutances, Bishop of Rouen. Now, the citizens of Rouen already had a council of officials. They called them consuls, or sometimes used a rather strange word, échevin, for them. Uh, when, uh, uh, in 1193, Richard was taken prisoner in Austria, the principal citizens of London swore a communal oath they called a sacramentum, same word as they'd used in Lombardy, uh, and the oath as a whole resembled that used in Rouen, and the London oath specifically referred to Echevin, so that it looks as if you got your constitution from Rouen. When King John came to the throne, the citizens of London paid him 3,000 marks for the right to appoint their own sheriff. John granted them a charter preserving their ancient liberties, including that appointment. And in 1206, the city and the king came into conflict about the level of taxation. The city demanded that tax, taxes should not be levied on them without the agreement of the king's council and the city. And this appears to be the first medieval reference to what we now call no taxation without representation. So you were in the van over that. Once the rebellion had started in 1215, uh, London was of crucial strategic importance because it controlled the route from Dover. The first stone bridge across the Thames uh, was completed uh, in London in 1209. Whoever controlled London could prevent the importation of mercenary soldiers from Europe and it was probably this that led John to grant uh, the city the right to choose its mayor in May of 1215. He realized he was going to be in a hopelessly weak position if he didn't have uh, the city with him. The person who was to be mayor had to be faithful to the king and discreet. I trust our current Lord Mayor meets those criteria. I shall ask the Lady Mayoress later. <laughs> the uh, Saxon office of a alderman became alderman, and those who governed the city became drawn from a narrow oligarchy, mainly from drapers, pepperers, goldsmiths, mercers, and vintners. The more self-important amongst them started to call themselves barons. The leader of the rebels was Robert Fitzwalter, 
He had contacts in the city. He was Lord of Dunmo in Essex, but also of Baynard's Castle in the city. Of course, you know all know of Baynard's Ward now. John had actually raised this castle to the ground, but Robert was still entitled to carry the banner of the city and to command the militia. This will explain why, when the rebels arrived outside the city walls on the 17th of May, the gates were open to them. Roger of Wendover, a monk at St. Albans, chronicled these events. The rebels, he said, entered the city without any tumult while the inhabitants were performing divine service. The rich citizens were favorable to the rebels and the poor ones were afraid to murmur against them. When John met the rebels at Runnymede, he was at such a disadvantage that he had no alternative but to make the grant. Clause 13, as you've heard, guaranteed London its ancient liberties and free customs. Uh, on display uh, tonight, some of you may have seen it already uh, in the Heritage Gallery, is a copy of a charter of 1297. Magna Carta 1297. We've already had four, now we've got a fifth one in 1297. Uh, it rehearses the final version of, Mag of the original Magna Carta, the 1225 one. But it is just as important as the 1215 one, uh, that, uh, as the 1215 one. England, um, in 1295 was still under the Regency government as you've heard and they requested the government the grant of taxation by the full council of the realm to defend Gascony against the French. The council deliberated for some time and offered to grant taxation if the king would confirm Magna Carta. This he did and thereafter similar bargains were struck up to the 15th century of tax for confirmation of the charter. The medieval world attached great importance to it. Henry II, uh, partly through inheritance, partly through marriage, partly through conquest, had established an empire that stretched from Normandy down to the Spanish border. John had lost all this territory by 1204. But he and his successors constantly mounted expensive campaigns to regain it. And of course, they needed taxation to support them. In the 1290s, Edward I sought such ta taxes on an annual basis. And in 1297, he summoned a parliament which, in addition to the barons of the realm, contained knights as representatives of the shires and burgesses as representatives of the cities. It had adopted a form at least recognizable as a modern parliament. When asked for further taxes, Parliament requested, on the old pattern, tax for confirmation of the Charter. This Edward did, recording his confirmation in his Statuta book. The copy of 1297 in the Heritage Gallery is a copy of a very early statute. Magna Carta was now a statute. And this, of course, preserved in perpetuity, the most famous of the clauses, clause 39, no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or dece deceased, which means put out of possession, or outlawed or exiled in it, or in any way ruined, nor will we go or send against him except by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Uh, trial by peers didn't actually strictly mean what we now recognize as a uh, jury trial, but it came to be interpreted later as the basis of it. Go on a little further from 1297 to 1330, when Edward's grandson, Edward III, started a war that was to last a hundred years. Anxious to get on with it, he departed for the continent, uh, leaving the Archbishop of Canterbury in charge of the realm with strict instructions to levy taxes to support the war. He failed. Edward returned in a fury and charged him with treason. The archbishop wrote complaining that this was an unseemly process. Will you condemn me without hearing me? Shortly after, 
Parliament passed a statute requiring that no man should be condemned without due process, or as the Americans would say, process. And that phrase is the one that now is used as a commonplace uh, for uh, protection uh, uh, against uh, 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 harassment by uh, government. Uh, when uh, John claimed that uh, he'd signed the, uh, I should say also that, that, that about the same time, it, 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 the original charter only applied to free men, or, and that included free women, though free women were regarded as inferior to free men for reasons I don't need to go into. Um, the, uh, um, uh, but that by, 13, by 1354, it applied to all men. Uh, King John was right when he said he'd, he'd been extorted under duress, and in fact, later constitutional developments were also uh, uh, extracted at the point of a sword. Uh, Lord Chief Justice Cook, uh, who was almost as great a Lord Chief Justice as Lord Judge, uh, prayed the Charter in aid uh, to claim that the king was subject to the law. Uh, he asserted, Magna Carta has no sovereign. The Stuarts claimed they were subject only to God. And the conflict was settled only by the English Civil War, again by arms. When William and Mary came to the throne, it was on a compact that they'd abide by the English Bill of Rights, but even this was only finally achieved after William had invaded England. In due course, when the English colonies were established in America, they adopted constitutions embracing parts of the Charter and the English Bill of Rights. The Virginia Constitution of 1618 claimed for settlers in that state the same rights as those living in London. And in Maryland in 1638, Magna Carta was specifically incorporated into state law. When others drew up their constitutions, they reflected the charter. This was hardly surprising, as many of those concerned in government in the New World had trained in the English inns of court. Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England, which lauded Magna Carta, was a bestseller in America. The Americans even went so far as to say that Magna Carta could defeat an act of parliament, and in due course their Supreme Court claimed the power to declare acts of cons Congress unconstitutional, a power that the English uh, courts did not establish. But again, the establishment of these rights was achieved only by force of arms on, uh, on behalf of the Americans. The American Constitution uh, contains a clause which clearly derives from Clause 39 of the, tw of the 1215 Charter. Curiously, the Americans sent Jefferson to Paris as ambassador to the newly created French Republic, and as a result of that, his friend Lafayette asked for uh, help in uh, defining a, a French constitution, and that, to this day, contains a clause similar to Clause uh, 39. So one can see from the very earliest of times the seeds of many of the rights that we now claim and which we take for granted, at least in this country, the seeds of those can be seen in Magna Carta. Thank you.